Hello and welcome to, let's say, another exciting episode of English 112. So first on today's agenda, we had a question from Ashley Williams. She wanted to know about the dogs and their legs burning like brush in Mark Strand's Eating Poetry. Uh, I didn't really see anybody address it too much in their analysis and their discussions on web study in the forums, uh, so I thought it might be helpful to give you my analysis sort of point by point and help you out uh, and sort of understand this poem a little bit better. Let's take this poem line by line, starting at the first. Ink runs from the corners of my mouth. Now, as I said in the forums, we could be talking about literally running, not just the figurative definition of it. So maybe the ink is literally running out of his mouth. It is scared of our speaker. And keep in mind, too, when you're discussing poetry, your speaker and your poet are not the same person, right? These are personas. These are characters that the poet is adopting in order to tell a story to, to, to sort of express their emotions or speak or some type of emotion. It doesn't have to necessarily be theirs. So we have this first image of the ink running, right? And it sets a certain what we might call uh, undecidability. We're not sure if he means it's literally running from his mouth or if it's a, a, a euphemism, if it's just uh, maybe not use, euphemism, but uh, just figurative language. He's not literally meaning that. And that uncertainty should already start to make us feel a little strange in reading this poem. And since we know that this poem is somewhat surreal, that definitely adds to the overall strangeness of the poem. The second line of the poem says, there is no happiness like mine, right? This is pretty definitive. We don't really have a lot of questions about that. So we can sort of start to put this uh, whole stanza together now, looking at that third line when he says, I have been eating poetry. So we have the ink running, right? The poetry, we can think of it, of it as running away from him and he's experiencing supreme joy unlike anything else. Now, take notice of the next stanza, right? This is when the librarian comes in. This is what we call a juxtaposition, right? It's a contrast of two different images. So our first one is a, of our speaker, his supreme happiness and sort of our confusion of the, the literalness of his words. But when the librarian shows up in the third stanza, right, it says uh, the librarian does not believe what she sees, so she's incredulous. Her eyes are sad, and she walks with her hands in her dress. Now, that sort of eyes are sad, we can, again, we can, there's not a lot of debate we could have with that, but we know that there's something wrong. She's incredulous, she's upset, and she's walking with her hands in her dress. Why is that important? Well, it, it's a defensive gesture. It's a defensive stance, and she's not coming to the speaker open-armed or being aware of what he's feeling. She's definitely... I'm sorry for that. I have to brush the hair out of my face. She's definitely feeling uh, like there's something wrong, and our speaker doesn't see anything wrong. And kind of answers why the librarian is upset. He says the poems are gone. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. right? We know it's gone because he's ingested them, but he may also be making a statement that uh, the poetry no longer exists because now he's consumed it or the poems no longer exist because someone is viewing him reading the poems. There's a lot of doubt and uncertainty in that line of, of what he means literally when he says the poems are gone. So now we have a couple of, of possible interpretations opening up and we'll get to them, or at least mine, uh, by the end of this. So this, he says the lights are dim and the dogs are on the basement stairs and coming up. Now this is where it gets super surreal. And this is the question uh, that Ashley started with. What do those dogs represent on the basement stairs? Now we think, okay, if they're coming from the basement, they're usually something that's buried, something that's being hidden, right? People aren't supposed to see. What do the dogs actually represent? And again, we'll sort of bring all of this together at the end of the poem and its analysis. 
the speaker says that their eyeballs roll, right? So we have this, again, figurative or literal. We're not sure. Maybe their eyeballs are literally rolling, right? Like ball eyeballs are removed from the head and rolling somewhere, or they're rolling in their head as we typically think of rolling eyes. And their blonde legs burn like brush. Again, are their legs literally on fire or are they just so warm and hot? And then the poor librarian begins to st stamp her feet and weep. Now, now we're getting this contrast of the, the dogs are sort of excited and the librarian's not acting in a adult manner. She's acting very childish. Um, and she's, this is not really what we'd expect. This is a sort of a, a reverse of our expectations. Um, you know, why the librarian's not going to stamp her feet and weep. She's going to tell the guy to get the heck out of the library because that's her job. But there's a reason, again, for showing her like a child. Her next stanza says that she does not understand. When I get on my knees and lick her hand, she screams, right? Now, if we're thinking of, of our speaker being transformed into a dog, and this po poem is very much about transformation and metamorphosis, uh, we have to see that as, as a dog would see that. And that is typically a very kind act from a dog. It's, it's, it means f they're being friendly. They're trying to... Uh, communicate with us in some way, you know, and not in a, a a threatening manner, but just one of of you know respect and care and admiration. But again, she does not understand this, and she's acting like a child. She doesn't even she freaks out when the dog touches her, almost as if she's got some kind of fear of man dogs or dogs in general. We've sort of explored all of these pieces of this poem. What the heck do they all mean? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is sort of separate this surreal, literal definition of the poem and start looking at it a little more abstractly, look at possible meanings, interpretations, to sort of get where Strand may be going with this. So, he, we have this very strange persona that's telling us about these things that he's doing. And we have to wonder who the librarian is and who our persona is. Now, when we talk about poetry, right, we're talking about typically a, 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 an art that has been saved, rescued, because remember, it's not, it does not sell well. People don't read poetry outside of, you know, their literature classes, at least not everyday people. Maybe poets do it, and some writers, but not everybody reads poetry. Right? Typically, we're doing it for academia, and academia is part of what helps poetry survive in today's day and age. And maybe that this, inter or this poem is about that type of thing going on in the world today. The librarian may represent the old-fashioned, the academic, the people that look at poetry in this very hypercritical uh, sort of way. They don't appreciate the beauty of it. They look at it as objects to be hidden away in a library, right? They're not supposed to be eaten. Eating is, the, is uh, to our speaker at least, the most sensuous and, and obvious demonstration of his love possible. But to the librarian, that's an assault on the work itself, right? So we have this sort of contrast, this juxtaposition, and as I mentioned earlier, where the librarian stands on one side. She, we can think of, is, and again, this is in accordance with my interpretation. Interpretations vary, keep that in mind. But she is the old guard protecting what poetry is supposed to be. And here is our man dog, our persona, our, our speaker, coming along and saying, no, we don't, I don't want that anymore, right? I, I want to be as physical and as intimate with my poetry and with poetry in general as possible. All right, so now here comes the question about the dogs. Well, maybe the dogs are the representation of that new sort of wave, that, that change, the sea change um, that we have here in poetry, right? This is, again, this is written in the 1960s. 
Uh, we'll do a little bit of historical analysis, but not too much, just keeping that in mind, right? People tended to do experiment with a lot of things. And it wasn't just poetry and it wasn't just literature. Yeah, they used LSD and yeah, they used uh, peyote and, you know, hallucinogenic drugs. So this sort of surreal poem fits in with that. And these people, these people that are trying to expand their consciousness, those revolutionary poets, we might think of them, are the ones being locked in the basement. That's who these dogs are. And Strand has yeah, he's gone through the history, theoretically, or well, I shouldn't say Strand, but our speaker has gone through the history of poetry by spending his time eating those poems in the library. But now he wants to let the dogs loose and join them and romp in the book, bookish dark, right? So this is one potential analysis of what this means to the best of my ability. And we could debate whether, you know, Strand is, is making some other argument or... He's making this one, but I think this is a good place to start. So the next thing I'd like to address is the responses in the forums. Uh, these things take time. They're not going to be perfect overnight. But again, I'm always going to keep prodding you uh, to give better and better responses, especially to your classmates. Uh, I think you guys are, are already on the right track in terms of your responses to the forum questions. I think you can be a little more focused, pay a little more attention and care to the question being asked um, and sort of spend a little more time uh, giving your analyses, analyses uh, a little more craft and consideration, being a little more specific, uh, breaking down that logic a little more. Uh, that could always be improved, but especially when it comes to your responses to your classmates uh, is where I'm seeing sort of the weakest effort being put forth. <clears throat> Again, it's not necessarily your fault. It's just a matter of you don't know as well as I do, or you're, you're ignorant. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just not knowing. So I too often take for granted that not everyone has had me uh, as a comp one professor and uh, not to say that I'm like the best or something, but there's certain things that I'm I emphasize in my comp one class that other professors don't. Um, it's just a different, it's a matter of perspective. So one of the things I tend to do is have workshops. And these workshops are designed at picking apart uh, people's papers, looking for problems. In an online class, we don't really have the time uh, or, or the resources to do it. We're, we don't have a class time where we can all sit and spend that whole class time critiquing each other's work. but we tr we can sort of do it in the forums to an extent. What I'd like to see you do more so, and I mentioned this already, you know, don't just blithely agree with each other, but challenge each other. You know, you have to ask questions and poke and prod at their argument. You're not going to agree with everyone. I don't expect you to. I think it's kind of absurd to come in and say, oh, yeah, I agree with everybody. Everybody has a great idea. No, not necessarily. Some people may have good ideas, but you still don't have to agree with them, right? So start to ask questions, especially. A ask them to follow up. Say, hey, you know what? This point you brought up, uh, I don't think you've fleshed it out enough, and I'd like to hear a little bit more of your thoughts and explanation. I'd like to add a short little anecdote about the workshop experience. You know, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer, and I started taking creative writing classes, and I remember they were the worst classes uh, that I took as an undergraduate. Majority of the time, I really enjoyed my literature classes, I even enjoyed my economics classes, my uh, physics classes, my calculus class, because those classes tended to give me a lot more information, uh, even though I really didn't care that much about things like economics, though I did care about literature. But in my creative writing classes, the reason why I felt so horrible almost every day I went to class, and why I was often upset about it, was because I really knew I wanted to be a writer, and I was in a classroom full of people who didn't. They were taking it because it was an easy elective. And creative writing classrooms are based on the workshop. Now, the workshop really is only as good as the class uh, that is in it. And if you have a lot of people who don't care that much, and a professor who doesn't really want to teach people how to 
uh, analyze and, and critique literature and tell people how to make their stories better, well, it can be very lonely if you're the only person that's very serious about it. And oftentimes I would get back my manuscripts and there wouldn't be any comments. And it sounds a little sadistic, but or maybe masochistic, but I really wanted people to tear my work to shreds. I wanted to know every single flaw, everything I did wrong, not because I'm, I'm sick, though I am, but because I wanted to get better, right? And that should be your goal. You're trying to make your classmates better when you are in the forums and you're asking questions and you're responding to each other uh, and you're disagreeing and you're pushing each other's arguments further. That's really what this is all about. It's about, you know, striking iron with iron. I, I obviously am writing, you know, novels worth of comments to you guys. Uh, sometimes, so I'm like, what? what? Are they even going to read all of this? But do it yourselves, you know, challenge each other. That is going to be beneficial to you because you're going to recognize the faults in other people's arguments, right? And if you are being thoughtful and if you're thinking critically, you'll start to apply them to your own. It's much easier to find the flaws in others' works than it is in our own because we are separate from it. We did not produce that work. So that's the big thing here. Remember, you know, my main goal as instructor, aside from, you know, teaching literary analysis, teaching how to write and things like that, the main objective is critical thinking. All of those other things sort of stem out of it. So if I can teach you to be a critical thinker, I can teach you to write well, and I can teach you to analyze literature. But we have to sort of overcome that first hurdle, and it starts with making yourself uncomfortable. So the last two things I'd like to mention here are Plath's poetry and Cam's article. So in Plath, we find a very interesting poet and typically I like to do a short profile on her um, at the end of our poetry unit because I think she's a great American poet. She's one of my favorites personally. Um, and she's sort of ushered in this confessional uh, poetry genre. Uh, not that we should call it a genre, but we can think of it slightly as one. And her big thing is writing about things that sort of make us uncomfortable. Uh, to, it tends to dwell on themes like depression and suicide. Um, and it's very much a part of Plath as a poet. It's part of her persona. Um, and her speakers are almost always dwell on some type of combination of those things. Uh, in Ariel, for instance, we get that suicidal depression. Um, in Daddy, we have sort of the combination of, you know, a, a, a unhappy daughter, but also this Nazi German Im imagery. Um, that sort of history and personal history are combined to make this very shocking uh, poem. And then in our last poem, Lady Lazarus, is very much about uh, the idea of suicide. It's a very philosophical sort of a asking that question or answering that question um, that uh, not Sartre, uh, Albert Camus asks, in his book, The Myth of Sisyphus, he says, there is but one philosophical question, and that is suicide, whether it is life is worth living or not. And in Lady Lazarus, we find a type of answer to that, though it's not particularly a happy one or a useful one uh, for those of us who enjoy living. So that's sort of a, a quick look at who Plath is as a poet. Uh, of course, she did end up committing suicide and succeeding. I believe she uh, attempted suicide a number of times during her life, but she uh, famously killed herself while her children were asleep. This was after she broke up with her uh, husband, who is a terrific poet, Ted Hughes, and uh, she stuffed her head in the oven and died of suffocation. A very tragic woman. Now, uh, Heather Cam, in her article, uh, about Daddy and her debt to Anne Sexton presents a argument that, hey, you know what, Plath learned a lot from Sexton, and here's a, an example poem, My Friend, My Friend, and here are the little bits and pieces that she uh, sort of steals from. Again, your job in this forum post is to decide whether you believe this argument or not. Uh, frankly, I'm a little skeptical, personally. I don't know that I entirely buy it. 
Uh, I think it's it's a nice idea, but I don't know that the the argument is there. I don't know that the evidence is presented strongly enough. You know, and your job should be if you buy it, you know what? Give me examples. Give me proof that supports your claim. If you don't buy it, same thing. I, I'm going to try to not give you any sort of help on this right now until we get into the forums. Uh, because I do want you to come in with with sort of uh, without any expectations. So keep that in mind. And finally, there are two bits of administrative things I'd like to mention. Uh, one, next week you have a ton of reading. Uh, I mean, an absolute ton. Uh, there's quite a few short stories. There's a lot of articles uh, that I've written about craft and about things like setting and theme and symbolism. And I expect you to read all of them. I expect you to read all of your short stories as well. Uh, it's not optional. And it's not just like choose two of these things. No, read everything. So really make time next week. And give yourself uh, you know, enough time to finish all those readings. There, Again, there is a lot. It's probably the most reading heavy week we have. And then eventually things sort of coast afterwards. But next week's an important one. So make sure you do that reading. The second thing is... Uh, JSTOR. Some of you may or may not know how to access it. Uh, it seems like the, we've already had a couple people uh, writing on the forum, so they figured it out. But if you don't know how, go to the website, uh, the college's library website. It's uh, you go to Delaware uh, DCCCC.edu. Go into the library services. And there you will be able to find the databases. In the databases, you, I think you'll have to log in either before or after you choose your database, your da da the database you want to choose is JSTOR. All right, from there, search for the article. Just copy and paste the title of the article and search it. It's very simple. I don't think you'll get con too confused. If you do get confused, please email me. I want to make sure that you are accessing the articles and you have a chance to read it. Last thing, I said, I know I said two, but it's actually three. Uh, your poetry paper is coming up very shortly, so make sure you're working on it this week. Uh, if you haven't already started it, uh, it's a, I believe, a three to five page paper or two to four page paper. I don't remember off the top of my head, but make sure you turn in a good one. You know, I'm very critical of papers. I want them to be good because I don't like to read stuff that's not. Take your time with it. If you can, finish it early and then come back to it maybe a day or two, two days before the deadline and reread it out loud. That is the number one thing I want you to do is... Read your paper out loud after you have finished it. Don't just type it up and send it in. Make sure that at least, at the very least, it's proofread. If not, uh, well-structured and well-written. Reading the academic form essay that I wrote is it will be a big benefit. It will make sure your paper is well-structured. And that typically is a big problem in student papers. So read the academic form article. Take the time with your essay. Look at the things I've written. Uh, and the examples, the example poetry paper will help as well. All of those things, use them to your advantage, right? I'm giving you all the resources. It's up to you to make the best of them. So with that said, that's all that we have to say for this week. Peace.